speaker this morning. So she has taught literature and language courses, and her research interests include Cebuano literature, heritage, and culture. She has taught technical translations for different organizations. She also does literary translations and writes poetry in English and Cebuano. Her creative works are her outputs as a member of WILA, or Women in Literary Arts, in Cebu, and mga anak sadagang or bad, if you're familiar with that. Currently, she serves as the chair of WILA. So let us all welcome Miss Jonathan Gabales. A round of applause. together, glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without the Father, and in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hope you actually are also included in the year and then show us. In a little pool, what's the pool? But probably it's because, can you hear me well enough? Yes. Probably it's because um, the last time I taught in USC was 2009. It was nine years ago. Kind of. Last case story na wala, That's not the point of being here today. So, uh, as scheduled, we say we have pre-war, no? Pre-war, Sabono literature during the pre-war period. Of course, by war there, we're referring to which war? World War II. A lot of historians, however, would refer to that that war as the Pacific War. So it's, a, it's another term you can use, not the Pacific War. Okay. Uh, we weren't really involved in the whole world, uh, 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 even the Philippines, but we were involved in this particular uh, section of, of World War II. Um, that's also interesting because we, we say it's pre-war era, but within that period, World War One was fought somewhere else in the world. I don't know. So, but uh, we're talking about our own circumstances here in the Philippines, in particular, of course, sa Cebu. Um, actually, what I'm going to try if you plan to Okay. Ang tingin mo na, di na tama tingin mo na. Another uh, term we can use to describe this particular period is it's the golden age of Sabono letters. So we have those dates. Uh, you know, I don't really know how to use this. Where do I aim this? There? Okay. That's another term now that we can use. Okay, on but yeah. All right, so I was asked to do a social historical context first. Um, we can't do away with it because 
on literature during this time. I would even say, you know, Philippine literature is really uh, attached to uh, uh, events, circumstances uh, in, in our history and society. It's totally divested from all these contexts, especially this particular period. So, um, but before that, let's take a look at photos pre-war. So you recognize the building? Yeah. What by good doctors? What by? What by coffee prints? It's a bar. What by what are you doing? No, so black and white view. Yeah. So you can imagine the photo is also taken aerial, no? but of course the drone and the gamut ani. Okay, what my drone? So this was um, taken by, I suppose, one of the military personnel, American at the time, on a plane. So the Kuang photo. Did you know that uh, when it was built, when this uh, the Capitol building was built, they, a lot of people did not like it that it's situated there because it's too remote, or no? Ang mga akta, mga duwin nila kuno sa hill, sa likod, sa capital, ang mga ato. It's a very remote location. So, compare that to how we see the capital today. Um, no? and, and very much that area, that uptown area is still a, the hub. No? Nabiyahan na na itong downtown Osahay. Lahin na itong connotation sa downtown Gani. No? Downtown Sibu. Okay. So that would be Jones Avenue, no? Okay, uh, uh, back view. You can see, I think, the entrance to the Capitol Social Hall, Walapai Palace of Justice, which was, of course, destroyed uh, during the earthquake. So there. And yeah, of course, how one pa? Walapai Makipan nga, Robinson's gallery. I said, really? Walapai Chongwa? Walapai Robinson's? And so, of course, no. You don't have it down, no? Of course, the architecture is neoclassical because that's what the Americans brought in here. During the time in the U.S., um, the neoclassical style in architecture was very, very popular, and so they brought it in here. So I think, you know, I guess if you go on a walking tour around the city, uh, guide, tour guides will tell you or point out all the neoclassical buildings within the city. And again, that enriches our uh, cultural experience of Cebu as a local, and um, hopefully, if you have friends also from outside of Cebu, from everywhere else, you can do your own walking tour with them. And of course, I have to add, this is pre-war you see, this is not the downtown campus building. Um, this was a building just before it was trans before they transferred to the downtown campus. Alright, so from the Dr. Medallion collection. So anyway, um, so the years, the golden age of Tabona letters, uh, roughly 1900 to 1940 have been collectively referred to as the golden age of Tabona letters. This era is also a very dynamic era and historically demanding that started a decade before the 20th century. So before the Tung 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 1900s, of course, so many things were at Work, no, creating, uh, creating the res uh, a lot of effects and results during this 40-year period. So you have 1896, the year of the revolution. But when did the revolution against the Spaniards arrive in Cebu? No. When was the KKK cell or chapter in Cebu? What year, if you know, established? Actually, 1897. Uh, so, who established the chapter here? Leon Pantaleon Valiegas, now uh, from Negros Oriental or Leon, Leon uh, Kila. <laughs> what about the uprising? against the Spaniards. When was it? So, 1896, sa kauruhan na no? 
Ito sila dito ba na-establish. 1897, established the way, pinahinay sila plano. 1898, March, the leaders of the, the Catepuneros of Cebu decided, ah, we will have an uprising. They appointed the day April 8. May lahat plano. But before April 8 happened, uh, there were a lot of executions, the Ibawan, the sympathizers, the Puneros. And so they had another meeting. They decided to have the revolt earlier. And so it happened that we have the Rest de Abril, which was actually a calm Sunday. Calm Sunday. The motto, Namatay si Nian Kilat, the Good Friday, within that whole week, no? So, uh, so mo ano yung paspas kayo ni Tabo? Um, 1897, 
It's a uh, very common epidemic at the time. Uh, according to family history, uh, my, like my grandfather's grandfather married twice. His first wife died, and so he married again. It is said, they say, in Urban Sila, he had 13 children with the first wife, he had another 13 in the second wife. With the second wife. With the second wife. But not all of them grew to adulthood. No, no, no. Anyway, uh, childhood mortality, infant mortality was high then. Human, human. Ah, but I found out because my grandfather <laughs> lived and loved during the time of cholera. So it was a cholera epidemic keep coming back, keep coming back. Uh, 18, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s. The worst at cholera epidemic was in 1909. But you know who it is? The worst times becomes also that become also the best of times. It makes people rise up to the occasion. So as a result of the cholera epidemic, what was built? Would you know? What's the cost? What's the cost of cholera? Nai ko ano? Nai nai virus sa tubig, di ba? It's usually the lack of potable and clean water that causes the cholera. Because most of the time, before the these happen, people get water from or touch the wells. And so, what was created? The first water search systems were created. And so, Bugis and Dam was built. So if you're familiar. Uh, it's the same also in my father's hometown. The first water system of Mualboa was built during this time to address the problem of the cholera. I'm happy. Well, it's one of all photos again within the city and even Labo Lapo. Let's just keep that. Wait. I'm missing one. So, uh, Sabona said to contend with institutional and infrastructural construction, Moragtarun, no? Sa shop boys area. <laughs> Together with lack of agriculture, productivity, calamities, and plague, famine, and epidemics. Pero sige lang. No? Uh, because like I said, it also made people look for solutions. Even the concept of, of Suri Suri, Subu, yes. I think it really started here. And Oman. Before the American period, there weren't really good roads. But during the American period, no, no problem with the southeastern portion. Maragara running road, but ang southwest. No? So, kanang mag round south ta? Kung idea ba ito na mag joyride round south? It started at this time with the construction of the Karkar Bareli route. So, pwede na dito ka round south. Hindi na naman ang dal. Magnanin ba yung maagian dito? So, we try to look back and imagine what was then happening to them and how, you know, what changes happened to them at this period had also affected us. Okay, one very important and very related to our topic is the start of print literature in Cebu. Uh, so, El Bolitín, which is the first newspaper published by Eduardo Jimenez. Famous Abuanos uh, contributed to it, like uh, Mariano Cuenco and Sergio Simania. Right. A lot of statesmen were all statesmen, sorry, were also writers at the time. That's a very interesting uh, point also to consider. Uh, church publications were also present, huh? um, but. Uh, as, uh, together with these religious publications were secular, was that kind? Even short-lived, no? one or two issues. Yeah. But the same publisher would have another one. Okay. So for example, um, you have uh, El Nuevo Dia. Translate? Uh, All right. uh, referring, of course, to not just a new day, but a new era, I suppose. Ang Suga, which was, of course, editor was, who knows? So, father of Sabuano letters. Yeah. 
Siya ang istoryahan ha. Dalay lang ang kaliyan. If you would find me sometime uh, criticizing, you know, you know things, you just call my attention if it's too much. Okay? I can be very sardonic about. I guess you can understand what I mean. Okay. So uh, the first newspaper in um, Sabuano, where Mommy was first published, and uh, I also would like to point where. Guma sa Inahan, which is the short story of Maria Alcoro Cabigon, from Parpar de Hapon, or Mani Garia, was also first published. Uh, I, I point her out because, well, she's my, she's my muse, si Maria Cabigon. In other words, this is. So we know him. Other important Sabuano publications. So you would have Sabuano names of, of the periodicals or in in Spanish. Uh Kusuk used to be Nueva Fersa. Nueva Nue, Nue, Nueva Fersa. But of course realizing that they would rather use the vernacular language than, than Spanish, so the publication. I'm free man, which is now still existing. So it's the oldest newspaper that we have. Then how many banner since 1911 but now or within the period. In fact, what you can do, I think uh, when I was working with the Cebuano Studies in, uh, as a research assistant at the Cebuano City Center, I looked at the Ang Freeman on the day of my birth. I found out on the day I was born, the Sabonis Study Center was inaugurated. Wow! Twin na ko ang Sabonis Study Center. So you can actually do that. That is, of course, you go to the proper channels. No? You can find out what happened. Kinsay, uh, what do you mean? I'm referring to? I don't mind. It's December 3, 1975. I'm 42 years old. So that you don't have to do the math. <laughs> okay. So you have Hawaii, of course, uh, which was a, uh, uh, sort of a magazine. I think it's a newspaper. It's a magazine. The, the, the target market would be women, housewives, no? So, so really, the, the clamor for materials, reading materials was there. So that means reading, uh, the reading community, the reading population is, can imagine the Kotako. No? So I guess it kind of makes me think also, with all the posts of people going to the BBW, Big Bad Wolf, does it mean, anakadaghan to readers? Uh, or anakadaghan ang mga tao maganahan ng board of books? Orders but I am assuming, I am, uh, uh, I am hoping that they will really read those books. I think they will. No? Let's be positive about it. <laughs> no, uh, no. You know, I'm happy a student of mine picked up the book two of Harper Lee because she made a book review of To Kill a Mockingbird and she liked it so much she went to the BBW to buy Go Watchmen. Happy na po. Book to na siya. Same author. So, one very uh, one conclusion we have here would be literature is closely aligned to the rise of and the development of journalism during this time. Because, of course, the periodicals carry literature sections, the literary sections. They publish nila. So, one writing was at its height, can you imagine the numbers? Huh? Somebody should post this and then compare it to the number of, I don't know if they counted the, many, uh, the people, people coming in and out of the BBW. 180 periodicals, more than you passed out but they were very, like a few pages. Huh? 10,000 poems published between 1901 to 1941. 
Kaya na kung existing pa ang mga periodicals, we have them on file sa Bona City Center, na agad po na uman, i-upo na tayo sa yellow na may yung pages, no? so you can gather that. And uh, many of our researchers now doing uh, literary studies try to, uh, usually we do it, digitize, no? makik-makik, so kung gusto, picture-picture, before ka makahimo sa so, thesis, sana, oh, thesis. <laughs> 1,081 poets contributed to the whole book alone, alone. Okay. Okay. At some point, even Amado Osorio complained. There are too many submissions. It's a multitude of poets here in Cebu. But he sounds frustrated. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Insoy, uh, this is kind of like submissions to this pop uh, songs. We see that mo, mo express my shana, that kind of need not that kind of galata put up on a maot na mga contributions of songs. One in situation, oh sorry at the time, the galata put on really publishable. <laughs> So in, in response to that, Osorio and uh, Villarino, Satorio Villarino, actually wrote in their columns mga rules in writing poetry. So it was a very uh, important concern at the time. You had to be right with measure, with rhyming, etc. No? So, but there were rules uh, sort of dictated by these two men in, in the literary world. But one result of this is the presentation of the Cebuano language. And this, there is a revival now. No? Like for example, um, a few days ago, uh, City Sports contacted me because they were uh, developing a facility, a new facility, and they wanted to have a Cebuano name for the facility. Pagtawag sa ilahang, ilahang co-working space. So there's a revival now, no? So, naritindahan ni Nena, no? store ni Nena. That's right, this is our visible changes. Because for the longest time, Cebu in much of the Philippines is visually English. Di ba ang mga signs natin in English? Di ba pwede bilingual at mga signs? Ah, oh, wala dyan para bilingual, sorry. Uh, or, or di ba pwede binisaya ang atong mga science na lang? Huh? Sorry. Uh, the prestige of the lack of Sabuana language is shown in the class status of its writers, well, uh, wealthy manilas, the literati of, of the community, the ilustrado, kumbaga, educated. Dominance as a medium of the press, um, like we said, those uh, periodicals really have Sabuano as a me uh, medium. Participation of the elite in design academy, um, uh, academies of language academy, not language academy, language academy, but getting a group of people but coming together and discussing, even debating um, over the use of language, correct term, correct spelling, etc. And numerous newspaper articles and questions of language use. Which, of course, Osorio for one and uh, Villarino also uh, tried to answer. Why? Why is Sabano language uh, put in the forefront uh, prestigious at the time? Nationalistic feelings were high. Huh? Of course. Uh, of course, during this time we were under the Americans, but this is the idea of knowing that, uh, well, the Spaniards are out. And many of the writers didn't want to use Spanish because, well, we kick them out, why are we going to use their language? And as a result, English, uh, uh, and English was still emergent, meaning um, there were really a lot of people uh, fluent with the English language at the time. And it comes to mind the character, the characterization of one Luna. <laughs> and the Luna, the movie. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so writers debated, as I mentioned, on, on, on points, on vocabulary, principles of poetry. So you have equivalent terms, no? So for, for meter, it's like the measure, you right? uh, know? Usually uh, indicated by the number of syllables. You're familiar with this one. I'm sure you have had that experience. And we have that old poem, which I will let you do later. Oktok or kodlit accentuation. There's a revival. There's a revival of this one. Uh, uh, Willa, for example, is is going to come up with a book, uh, a series of children's stories. Yeah, we, we really decided it's bilingual plus with the uh, accents, huh? like their critical marks, because it's not just a an aid in teaching vocabulary but teaching how to say the words. Huh? Okay, that kind of a pattern on an actor on the table of basa di Bisaya. Kasi po sila unsa nga pulo, may isa ka sa table of basa ba. Kaya accent um, you know, and these things. And then bad guy is actually right. Yeah. Okay. So dire na yung kag bad guy yung Selena. Pero ang una nga linya ning bad guy sa sunod nga linya. So concern for kananoy Mananoy, no? the quality of being uh, her, little was in, and, and harmonious with ears was also prevalent. It was a concern. Um, in a way, in a way, Spanish metrics was still um, uh, influential. Okay, this was uh, uh, the template no? they used for classic Samoan poetry. Okay. And then, you have these romantic notions of the Magbabala. Romantic of Magbabala. Yes. Sentimental. Um, there should be a book. Myths. <laughs> Surrounding the, the Magbabala. No? Um, I think I think writers in general come in all uh, shapes and sizes. And sure, sure romanticism is an influence. And sentimentalism. Sentimentalism was a big force in, 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 in literature at the time. No? It was what, was what people clamored for. Uh, and thus, you have the uh, aspects of sentimentality and the essay of Dr. Isil Mahores. Now, as a critical, uh, as a critical vantage point in reading literary works during this time, a novel man, a short story man, but of course there were uh, some writers who tried to go against this. One limitation, sort of a setback, is the over cultivation of certain kinds of diction and sentiment. Resulting to, you read one poem, you read them all. And they had a template, which we will see in a, in a little while. The base focus on whether English or Spanish models should be adopted in writing Saguano poetry. But even American literature didn't, uh, didn't yet influence the Raka, our writers at this time. Those are familiar with, say for example, uh, so Philippine literature uh, in English would know uh, the influence would come on to the next period. These were discussed last time, so I will not push that. But they had some influence still. Uh, there was a question on Suga. I answered that last time. Uh, yesterday, there was a question on Suga. Uh, the Salubo is a very common form, religious dramat uh, dramatic form during the Spanish period. Uh, I don't know, however, if it was that popular during the Spanish times. It is a Cebu, but all throughout the Philippines, it was practiced. So I suppose it's it, you can consider it as a dramatic form that really developed during the Spanish era. Okay, so I based this from the table of contents of 
which you cannot acquire anymore, Namorot naman. I guess you got the blue. This is the volume one, the green version of the blue version that most of you in the map is holding over there. So some names, Aminel Hadiha. Um, I, later on, you would see a link to the, uh, to the page of the website of the Sabuana Sari Center. It has a, pre, uh, a portion entitled Pre-War Writers with a short biography and picture if available. So, you can actually do that on your own. All right. Sa kanya nga lista, kinsa yung pinaka-importante? Kini, Marie. <laughs> and she was in my Sabuano literature class. Hello, mga tawag ko. Why would you say Vicente Ranudo? Okay, um, valid enough. Alright. Ranudo was considered as the dean of Sabuano poetry. Ang pag nanong dean, na alis ni college at yung Sabuano poetry. You know what I mean? It's really like, top gun. Uh, he was known for two poems alone. Maybe there were other poems, but they were there, there are no extant copies. So you have Hikalintan. Nagin na question mark so. Pasama ni mo Hikalintan, no? Nagin na question mark ang title. O pagusara or paginusara, good, no? Uh, and his poems were memorized by a whole generation. Yung ngayon ka ka generation ba? Pila ka ka buo kung nasubot, no? Pila ka po kung nasubot, gamit ang hikalintan. Pila ka ka po. I suppose, eh, I suppose, although they were not originally theirs, ato na ugon sa pag, pagsuntib, ah, pag, ah, ang dramatic interpretation of the poem, you know? Ang pag, as ang pause, as ang accent, as ang, ang, kuan, ang focus. More names. Kasi gara na ni nila mo ragdala na lang atong ibaw ano. A balance pinili ay sa mga isda is very interesting. Like it's a it's kind of like a fable. The characters are fish or or sea creatures, and they were having an election. Going to have an election. And you can just imagine them going about their business as fish or coquita or unsa pa diha hapol. But of course, they have anthropomorphic qualities. They're very um, uh, per, uh, the per personification of certain uh, personality. Ba? So you can tell, ah, this is really what's going on in politics. Galing lang to the eyes of and to the mouth of, again, mga isda or mga sea creatures. Uh, wait. Uh, we will not take a look at everything. We will read Hikalitan in a little while. Uh, we will also take a look at Among Bandila by Tomas Fabio. And Dalagang Pilipinhon by Vicente Patrida. And if you recall, I gave some notes earlier on poetry. That should actually, the title should actually read Form and Structure of Classic Sabana Poetry. Now, what we want to delete word of form, can you just please add it? It's Form and Structure of Classic Sabana Poetry. Oh, there we go. If you have a we mentioned him last time, no? Uh, the the Green Book actually credits him as poet for mga awit ikan sa Rosas Pandan. But I did some looking. I, I mentioned earlier last time. I, I mentioned yesterday. Na somebody else actually did the libretto, and composed the songs and the lyrics to the play entitled Rosas Pandan, no? and that was Domingo Mingoy Lopez. He was a very prolific composer. The Ingon, uh, Sa iyo ko siya mamata, magputing-puting na siya niya ang gitara. Before breakfast, duhan na kakanta niya makupose. Ano na siya kakuha niya? 
Nai mo doon, mga ayo, o composition, era ko nagpangatag, really? No? So, we're like, huh? Yeah, well, he would be admonished by relatives, so just give them free, and he would just answer, I can make another one. So, I don't check up with it. It was known for, and he was an actor also. He actually, uh, he actually also uh, acted in Katong Rosas Panda. He's known for the songs Bukit Nun. Of course, you know, very popular that even in choirs in, in other countries would sing Balita Ni Rosa, uh, Balita Ni Rosa Spandan. Uh, yeah. And Bukit Nun, which has more or less the same lyrics. I suppose they belong to the libretto of the play itself. So, Domingo Lopez, don't forget his name. I hope I will know. Ah, uh, kailangan mong Natalio Bacalso? Ibigan sa ACT Parum dito sa Santander niya, the Natalio Bacalso Avenue. Uh, na traffic and as a shockwise na part. <laughs> right. uh, I mentioned Osorio earlier. He was, in, uh, just, uh, he was also a poet. But at the same time, he, he, in his column, he would be giving out rules through how to write poetry. Oh, oh, you know this? Thank you. Very good. Uh, the first two slides of names of poets uh, were the earlier poets. Uh, and uh, if you notice, there were titles younger. Nationalistic, Ang Bandila. Uh, ang mga nangapukan sa kagab... Alang sa mga nangapukan sa kagabhion, which is uh, uh, dedicated to the Katikoneros, Katikoneros nga nangamatay sa Tres de Abril na Bato. But in the later period, mga 1930s no, period, we have later poets, starting probably with Ignacio Fernandez, then Emiliano Batcancila, um, Vicente Ibanez, and these names. And finally, we have one lady, Cardio Patria Quejano, a quadro which, which we will also take up in a little while. So, Usara. Um, uh, there were women writers, not as many as men writers. Uh, I mentioned uh, Gary Quijano, of course, and you have uh, Maria Arturo Capigon, Sinforosa Alcordo, na ikakao na ni Manikaria, na man. But I guess uh, those that really were excelled ba, who's the other man? Also, it may be with all due respect to the editors, <laughs> it may be a problem of the anthology. Nga wala gi tagaan o daghang luna, nakaudakong luna ang mga kababayinan. So, sa rin ipasurug nila. Nga ang mention of Inday, sort of the muse, or the one addressed to in the poem. But, ngayon ni po si Gary Patagihano, so more about and, and the way I see it now, it's more like, Ana she will, she can outweigh all the, but well, doesn't have to be like that also. But maybe that's, um, yeah, they were collecting this anthology with a certain, you know, viewpoint. But that would be a challenge to us now, if we were making a new collection of poetry during the era, and more the, uh, women writers. Okay, so this is the link to that um, archive of Prira writers. My mga black and white picture, kung naamo na available, o mga um, short biographies nila. Okay, sometimes we, I, I know some of you may have done away with introducing the writer, the biography of the writer, as part of your of your lesson in class. Pero sometimes we, we also um, in this case we need to because we are reintroducing them to a to a, a generation of readers who did not know they were big time during their time so yeah we can do that and of course. Ranulo, Street, no? Yes, uh, 